do want to thank um, Brother Brad and uh, Sister Paula for the, and I stayed with them. I really appreciate the hospitality and the care. And, um, uh, you know, and I sat down with Brother Brad and we talked a little bit about the ministry and from a preacher's standpoint and appreciate the counsel and uh, the advice, you know, just the different things that we would rub off. And then I, I, learned, uh, I learned some things while we were together and uh, also with the wife. And so I'm very thankful for this trip. Not only did I learn things in the conference and also here, but while at the, uh, Brother Brad and his, his wife, I also, during the time of fellowship, I, you know, I here and I learned a few things, and I praise the Lord for that. And Pastor, thank you for, uh, for being very hospitable with your dear wife and uh, the boys. You know, We've talked about it ourselves and how appreciative we are for the way in which you cared. Thank you again, the church, for making us very comfortable. We thank the Lord for each one in different ways that you've been a blessing to us. We, we, we praise God for that. You know, we're, we're, we are clearly aware that, you know, the Lord places us or puts us in, in places that we're at so that we can reach that place, you know. So we're in Western Australia. We have a duty, and we know you are here. We'll go back, continue praying for you as the Lord uses you to reach you know, the ministry, to continue reaching those that need to be reached. <clears throat> I just want to share a blessing. Just uh, prior to us, we went into the city, and uh, see that Queen Street, Queen's Mall or someplace, yeah, anyway, someplace there. And then, um, as we were driving back, I got a text message from my wife saying that, um, you know, we, we've kind of adopted two uh, little Aboriginal uh, children, a girl and a, a boy and a girl. The boy is 10, the girl is um, two and a half, 10 and three, and they're just wonderful children. And um, the moms had some issues, and they, they just lost their grandmother, I think a month, a month ago. And it's been hard on them. And so we've been praying much every time. We sit down with the two children and just teach them that we need to pray, pray that mom gets saved. You know, we need to pray that God. And so today, someone else comes and preaches at, at our pulpit. And their mom actually walked up for salvation. And so yeah, we really rejoiced. My eyes, I shed a little bit of tears, you know, just thinking about them. And uh, uh, seriously, I, I, we, as a family, we fasted for that young lady. If you only just know the background, you'll understand why I really want to share that. You know, we rejoice. And then also increases my hope and my, my determination to stay there. There is hope, you know. Amen. Just watching that young lady come to know Jesus, you know. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the government says. I don't care, I don't care what people say. There is hope in Jesus, Amen. you know. All, all the Christians have to be is just be patient and hang in there. Hang in there and uh, we'll go. So... You know, if you continue to pray for missions and missionaries and the work that's around Australia, well, I want to remind and again encourage you to know that it's worth praying because we can, we can share blessings like that and you can enjoy being part of it. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, please open your Bibles to Isaiah 64. <clears throat> Isaiah 64. And while we're at Isaiah 64, <clears throat> if you're right there at Isaiah 64, may I encourage you to also, uh, put a finger right up there or put a mark or put something out there and then I'd like you to turn all the way to Isaiah chapter 1. And let me uh, introduce my message by using Isaiah chapter 1. I'll use Isaiah chapter 1 as, to introduce the message, and I'll preach out from Isaiah 64. <clears throat> then, okay, so if you're Isaiah 61, okay, put a mark there, and then Isaiah 64. Let me just read Isaiah 64. In Isaiah 64, prophet Isaiah, prophet Isaiah goes out and prays this wonderful prayer. He prays, all oh, that thou wouldest render the heavens, and that thou wouldest come down, and that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, and to make thy name known to thine adversaries that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down, and the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither have they, have, hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waited for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, 
those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned in those, in those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, thou hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are, we are the clay, and thou art the porter, and we are, and we all are the work of thy hand. Let me just um, stop and have a word of prayer for us. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, tonight we want to thank you and praise you for the, the doors of the house of God still remain open. The people of God come to worship you. I do ask, Heavenly Father, that you'll, you'll fulfill the purpose of this hour. Give us a very teachable heart, and I pray that we may be open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Most importantly, may you be honored and glorified. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that we would, list, we would learn lessons out from this word. May we be encouraged to keep on keeping on. Help me as I do my very best to preach your word this evening. Pray, Lord God, for again, unction to function, power from on high, Lord, to preach your word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for it's in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. We see in Isaiah chapter 1, if, you, uh, if you're there in Isaiah chapter 1, we see the introduction of uh, Isaiah, especially with the vision. And in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 1, the vision... Uh, the vision of Isaiah, let's have a, have, have a read. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the king of Judah. God raised um, Isaiah, and Isaiah was, um, he served under these kings, and at the time there was something that was known about the kings of, uh, uh, the kings of Israel in those days. One of the things that they were known for was this, um, there was it's just a, a line that would always uh, describe them, and they would, they would always describe them. And they, the man who would all come to a point in their life, the man who would do that which is right in their own eyes or in their own sight. And it was a big influence. That influence was uh, such a major influence. And so people, as verse number two would remind us again as we read, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have, what is that word? They have rebelled. They have rebelled against me. And he, uh, he sees that, and then in verse number three, it gives them an il illustration to really drive that point home. He says that the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's creep, but Israel doth not know. And my people doth not, what's the word, consider. He uses an animal to, uh, uh, just to try to relate or give us clarity on what he's trying to explain at the, the, the people, the, especially their heart at that time. And he uses, in verse number two, he, he says that they have rebel, rebelled against him. And in verse number four of Isaiah chapter one, the Bible goes on to say, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, and they are gone away, which way? Backward. And in verse number five, the question is asked, why should ye be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more, and the whole head is sick, and the whole heart was the last word. Fine. We're given a description of, an, uh, of a nation that's turned against God, that's just turned away from God. And 
it's not a nice description of the nation. It's not a nice description of the people. You know, nobody would want to call their children, uh, you know, uh, you're corrupt. Nobody would like to call people who say that, you know, I love God and I know God. Nobody would want to call them, you know what, you might say that, but really you're, you're just going backward. You know, nobody would want to be described like that or labeled like that. Nobody would want to be told this, mate, you're, heading, uh, you're, you're sick in the head, uh, mate, you're, you're not serious, you're not true, you know. I can see your heart, there's just nothing serious about your life. Nobody wants to be labeled like that. Nobody wants to be even identified with that. But the thing about God's word is this, that it will actually bring, bring the situation as it is, which now that we see now. And it was in a situation like that, that the Bible was the vision of Isaiah, and it was not a good vision if you see verse number one and the many, many verses that are to follow. Nonetheless, it was a vision that God gave to Isaiah, reminding him that, the people might be in this situation, but you are the one that I'm going to use. The people might be in this situation, but you are the one that I'm going to use. This evening, I want to simply title our message, You Are the One, or I Am the One. We are the ones. For God to turn a nation and a family and a community and a society around, of course it will, it will be God, but he will have to work through you and I. He'll have to work through the church. We make up the church. We are the church. And so as doom and as, as, as bad and we might say as rotten as it is, the description of the people, God still gave the men of God the responsibility to get out there and do something. You know, as we look around, you know, I, I come from a third world country. I come from Papua New Guinea. I see certain things that happen in Australia and how things are done here and there. Sometimes I wonder, you know, oh, you know, should I be here or should I go back to my country? There are certain practices, certain things that go, and not, not as if my country is even any better. No, it's worse. Wherever you go, there is sin. Wherever you go, there are people who, as the description of Isaiah chapter 1, you find people like that who fit the description. We're at a time when we see Australia now, you know, I mean, that's interesting, you know. We struggle to fill a church up. While the night, night clubs and the sporting, uh, sporting uh, clubs don't even struggle to fill that up. In fact, they pay to fill it up. And it's free here. They pay to make the numbers. There's no payment to come into church. It's free. But then we ask the question, why? Or maybe the nation has gone darker. Maybe the people have... Uh, uh, this, uh, this could really describe where you are at and where we are at and a nation as a whole of Australia. But again, like the title of my message, it will take you and I. Of course, like Lyndon said, with God, we're a majority. Pastor, is there any hope in the days in which we live now? Can there be a revival? Can we win some more people again? Can the pews and can the seats be filled up again? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. History of, revival, in, in, history of revival is this. It never came when everything was going well. It came when people were at the lowest and the deepest and the darkest of sinful life when God visited them. So people might look around and say, well, you know, Australia has become this type of country and there's no one in the church and people have walked away and I just heard this week that Australia is a country where there's all, all this go, young people don't come, little children go, and that's the way they regard. Well, you know, I don't care what people say and how they describe it. A soul is a soul. Without Christ, go to hell. And with Jesus, they go to heaven. And knowing that and understanding that, we ask one question by starting our message. The question is this, then what do we do? What do we do? I'd like us to see how Isaiah prayed. And may that be our prayer. May that be our prayer. Verse number one, he starts off by saying, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, and that thou wouldest come down. You know, the first thing is, is this. When he prayed, he, he acknowledged very clearly, we cannot do it without you. You know, that's the first acknowledgement. We cannot do the work of God without you. And he goes on to say, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, and that thou wouldest, what are the next two words? Come down. Thou wouldest come down. It's, it's, it's an it's a acknowledgement that God, we try, we, we try to do it our way. And when we do it our way, 
We sometimes do it wholeheartedly, but there are times that we don't do it wholeheartedly. And there are times where we don't know whether we should or we should not. There are times that we want to do it, but we do it with doubts, you know. We do it with maybe uh, no belief or no faith in that. God help us. I really believe one of the issues that we're facing now is this. Men are getting used to do the work of God without God. We are now conditioning ourselves to accept that where we are is the way to go. We're now beginning to accept the fact that, well, this is who we are, this is what we are. Folks, I am a firm believer when a man works with God. I don't care what the situation is, what the place is like. God's far more powerful than a dark, dark, dark situation. God is able to save. And I think about myself. I'm a son of an alcoholic. I watch my dad drink. The only time he doesn't drink was only on Sunday morning because we'd go to church, make God happy. And then right after lunchtime, he was back in the pubs again, clubs again. But one day I was in a Bible college and I picked up a phone call. And Brother Ken, a guy who mentored me, got up and said, Pastor. Where's the brother Dallas? I said, yes. He said, I just led your father to know the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal savior. Amen. Folks, how many guest speakers had come and speak at that place? Men have come and preached and preached and preached. We waited, we waited. And you know, sometimes the longer you wait, the more you, the more you begin to convince yourself, I don't think there's any more hope. And then we take them off the prayer list. And then we really forget to pray about them. All of a sudden we hear that, oh, it's saved. And that's not because you prayed, because someone hung on to God and continued to trust God. If we all can just hang on to God and trust God, well, what a difference it will make. It is proven throughout the scriptures that it's God that makes all the difference. But he will need to work with us. And it is our, our, our responsibility to get, oh God, look up to the heavens and say, oh God, we cannot do it with, without, without you. Oh God. You know, in the yesteryears, it was the little groups, five ladies, a, a country church of about 10, 15 people who would get onto the altar and just continue to pray and pray and pray. And history has proven it time and time again. When the few, just the five or ten uh, people, would hang on to God and pray and call, God is just a simple preacher to turn nations around to God. The fact that we don't come and pray that long or pray, I mean, commit ourselves and spend the time in quality prayer is a sure sign that we want to do the work without God. We've got to find our face flat on the, uh, uh, on the altars. We've got to find ourselves uh, uh, broken before God. We've got to find ourselves down there and praying and pleading before God. God, I cannot do it on my own. We're nothing, God. It's hard. Uh, we knock on doors and no one seems to be uh, inviting us. We're discouraged. We're, we're disappointed. You know, we, we, just, we just can't go any further again, God. Folks, let me remind you again. In God, we can do it. Amen. It's not because of us. But the only one can make himself available and believe that God come down. Run to heaven, please. Whatever is holding you back, let loose. Come down. It's a, it's a lovely expression of a man t saying that, I cannot go without you. I cannot go without you. I knew I was preaching the message. And when I had the message about this young lady that came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it stirred my heart. If there was a flight tonight, I would have taken it and gone back right away after preaching. I'm excited to meet the lady. I'm so thankful to, you know, my children. My children, I mean, each one of them texts me, Dad, Erica got saved. Amen. You have to understand, there's a young Aboriginal mother, mother, very young, 14, 10, and 15 when she had her first child. It's been tough for her all the way. So government takes the children off. We've decided to stay with her. We're stuck by her. There is a restraining order that she can't come to the children. I go and whisper to her, come around the back. Come to the church. We will meet you at church. Seriously. I said, come around the church. I don't care what the government says. Come around the church. These are your children. You come and meet them. She'd come. We'd sit down together. Listen to the word of God. She'll have some feet and go back. We'd pray. We'd pray. We'd pray. She comes and goes. She comes and goes. But boy, too. So you can understand why, when she was, she was, while she was drying, you know, it's just typical of black fellows, you know, just, I knew there was a lady on the side of my teeth, I kind of just try to hide it, you know, and just do, doing this, you know. But the joy I just couldn't contain, just knowing that 
Seriously, it looked impossible. If you knew her life, you would say it's impossible. But the fact that God saved her again reminds us who is out there that's impossible to reach. God, please, we can't do it without you. Renders heaven. Come down to us. Let's go. You know, you know even for our, for our families here, you know, even for our families here, could go back to their homes, said, oh, what you know, pastor, the dad's not around. Pastor, you know, I'm just doing this. Folks, bring any situation that is difficult before God, and you'll find out who God is. There is nothing too hard for him. What men might think that is impossible with God, all things are possible. Folks, know the God that we serve. And so Isaiah said, God, render us heaven and come down. And he said, I know your presence will make a difference. He goes on to explain that, that, that thy presence, and verse number two, as when the, was the mountain fire burneth, and the fire causeth the uh, uh, waters to boil, and to make thy name known to thine adversaries. He said, what's the first thing? The first thing is this, oh God, calm down. We cannot do it. We, we, we can't do it without you. We need you. Secondly, what is it that we need? Remember, when he comes down, it has got nothing to do with you having a big name, me having a big name, or us having a big name. Oh, look at our church. You know, look at Fellowship Baptist. We become big. No, no, it's got nothing to do with us, but it's got to do with this. The second thing is about our motive. Look at what it says here. Verse number two. To make thy what? Make thy name known to, the, to thine adversaries. In a situation like this, Pastor, it's hard. Drug, alcohol, broken homes, a problem of the problem, trouble of the problem. Well, that's what Isaiah 1 describes in Isaiah's vision. But Isaiah said, you know what? It's been tough. Oh God, please, render us seven, come down. Secondly, we ask you to come down and be with us because our adversaries would know thy name. That the world would know who you are. Lyndon shared this morning, and Stephen, I think, shared this morning, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he uses a curse word today. But boy, when they know who he is, that one day every knee and every tongue will confess that precious name. One day when they know that, they will really know the power of that. For those who have lived, known Christ, but lived, uh, never lived up to that, they will know the importance of that. But for those who use it as a curse word, when they end up in hell, they wish they call upon that name. They wish they call upon that name. Because it's the only, only, name that's, uh, only name that was described as Jesus, as the Savior, save his people. It is the only name that, only person that had this name called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The second thing, come down so that your adversaries, that, that, that your name may be, might be known. We have a lot of enemies. We have a lot of things that are very negative. We have a lot of things that easily discourage us, easily offend us, easily paralyze our fire for God. There are so many things that easily just, just paralyze what we would want to do or even the conviction of God in our lives. And there are many things that could just easily just take the flame of those things away. Our fresh desire to go on for him. The other thing was this, you know, and he looks up, looks up not only that he says, you know, that your name needs to be known. I like the honesty of Isaiah. I know many times this verse has been used to describe the unsaved position, and which it does. But watch the way Isaiah uses it. Have a look at verse number five. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in the ways. Behold, thou art wroth for, what's that word now? We, very inclusive, Isaiah puts himself in there. Isaiah said, for we have sinned in those is continuance, and we shall be saved. And he goes into verse number six, he says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as what? Filthy rags. I'd like you to know, when Isaiah prays before God, he doesn't say this, I the prophet and the man of God, those of us who are doing right, we are here. No, no, no. He includes everybody. He, not a judgment. He's not judgmental in this situation. He says, you know what? It's us. Those of us who know God. There's something about us that's just, 
That's just not right. And he goes on to name it. He says, you know, he says, he says, our righteousness are as filthy rags. He said, you know, there are some things that we know that they are good, they are right, they are acceptable before you. But dear Lord, before you, it might be a right practice and, a, and, and, a, and an honorable practice. But seriously, God, you know deep down in our heart that there's something that's not right about us. One of the things about Christianity is this. Where there is iniquity, do not expect God to answer prayer. Where we mess around with sin in our lives, do not expect God to answer prayer. Sin in our lives is one of the biggest, biggest hindrances of God's work going forward. We're afraid to be confronted, someone to confront us regarding our sin, and it's even worse when we are not willing to what? Get before God and examine where we stand before God and then honestly and openly confess before God, name it before God. Lord God, I'm sorry. I said the wrong thing. Lord God, I'm sorry. I gossiped about other people. Lord God, I'm sorry. I stole. Lord God, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, and we are the best judges to our lives outside of God. You know, people can pray on our behalf, but it is best for us to pray before God, especially when we want to get ourselves right with God. And that's what's, I really believe that's what's lacking today. We're not willing to be transparent before God. I praise God and thank God for those who are transparent and who really want to do what's right. But you know what? The rest have to jump onto that. A church full of hypocrisy is not going to, uh, uh, just, just not a good witness. We can stand up. We can make a difference. There's nothing perfect about us. There's nothing uh, sweet and smooth about us. But there's one thing called confession and you get the forgiveness from God. And that's a wonderful thing because it's God who actually cleanses us. And it's God who actually purifies us. It's actually God who sets us aside. And he goes on to describe it by saying that our righteousness are as filthy rags and we do all fade as a leaf and our iniquities are like the wind. And they have what? Taken us away. What have they taken us away from? You know, there are many things that sin has taken us away from. And I always say these three important things that, that, that sin takes us away from. One is our prayer life. The second is our Bible reading. And third is this. It takes us away from a church. Folks, I'm a firm believer of the local church. I'm a firm believer of the local church. I'm a firm believer that if you're a child of God and if you're a Christian, you should be always in the house of God. I'm a firm believer of that. Why is that? Folks, you know, I don't understand why people would slave for the world six days, seven days, and wouldn't even find a time to be in church. They will never give an excuse to the boss for not being there, but they'll find an excuse not to be in the house of God. There are many things that come in the way and they, 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 they cause us to be like the leaf. They cause our, our fire, our desire, our love, and everything about God, it just causes it to kind of fade away. It becomes like a leaf, it just what? Flies away. People say, oh, I'm so sorry that person really, uh, uh, did you hear they backslid? And other, uh, folks, backslid never, st that was not the first day that the person uh, uh, backslid from God. We just heard it now, but it took place some, some weeks back, some months back. Sin has a way of causing us to just go from green to yellow, like a leaf, from green to yellow to what? Brown, and before you know it, it's gone. <coughs> what do we see here now? We see the transparency and honesty of the man of God. And I like the way he says it. He doesn't isolate himself to make himself look righteous. He says, we're all in it. Together we'll go before God. And I praise God and I thank God for that. And that's what makes Christianity different. We can all get together as brothers and sisters. Wherever we are spiritually, we can stand by each other, shoulder by shoulder, and we can really pray, pray for one another. We can share our prayer points with each other. We can share our prayer needs with each other. We can put the list of the unsaved people or the situation that we're going through. Uh, the one thing I'm thankful about Christianity is this. We can share that with each other, and then together we can take it to the throne of God. While he was talking about that, he said, you know, I look around and it's almost verse number seven. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our, what's that, inequities. You know, I like, I like the way he says it and I, I praise God and thank God. Isaiah says this, God, I'm sorry. 
He said, I'm, I'm sorry, God. He said, yes, that's right. Something has died. We're no longer calling on you like the way we would, have, we, we would love to call on you. You know, I praise God and thank God that this morning before church we had to get together and pray. It's a lovely thing. Make an effort to be always part of the prayer meeting. It's a wonderful thing. Our church is not special, but I just want to share a word of testimony on that. I really try to encourage all our, all our folks to come half an hour before the church. For us to get right with the Lord. Us to pray and really commit the service into the hands of the Lord. I even go one step. I, I even go one step. I even say this, if you're going to lead song or play the piano or be involved in the ministry like, like, uh, in that way, I even tell them, you know, if you, don't, if you can't be the part, if you can't be a prayer meeting, a prayer before me, you know, just sit aside. It's not about your talent. It's about being serious with God. It's about being serious with God. Come to, you know, you might have had a rough week, whatever it is. We're dealing, we're, we're talking about people. We're talking about being a lighthouse. We're talking about being the salt of this earth, reaching the people. Because you know what? Jesus made a f tough statement. He said, if the salt loses its what? You know, he said it very simple. What did he say? It is what? It's useless. We don't want to be that. We don't want to be that. That's why we want to come on the altar and just go down on our knees and together with other fellow brothers and sisters and we cry unto God and God, you know, we want your presence in, in the midst. We, we, we want nothing to hinder you. Forgive us of our sins. We want the Spirit of God to move. There will be people coming into the church. There are people who have prayed and prayed and prayed. There are families that are hurting so much. God, they'll be walking into the church. Could you please do something special for them? Well, we're living in a day and age where people are no longer want to call on God in that way anymore now. they would be so busy in their life, just come open the car, walk in and that's it, and go back to God. I've done your favor and I'm gone. God help us. Let's not be that type of Christians. Amen? When the change takes place in our, in our lives personally, with affect, it's contagious, affects our family and our <coughs> church. Folks, be rest assured. No matter how dark it is, God moves. God moves. He goes on to say that, and I would like to close with a wonderful and a positive way he ended it up, especially in verse number eight. He says, but now, O Lord, thou art our father, and we are the clay, and thou art porter, and we, are all, we all are the work of thy what? Praise God and thank God. Folks, let me say this now. None of us are perfect. I, I repeat myself again. None of us can get up and say, uh, you know, well, I'm above you. No, no, no. We're all just equal at the foot of the cross. You know, we're all equal. We got saved by the blood. No one had more blood, or less blood, or special Jesus. Or no, no, we just all came the way of the word of God. And, and uh, heaven is ours. Praise God for Jesus, our Savior. Praise God and thank God for that. But when it comes to molding and shaping, that's a different thing. When it comes to molding and shaping, that's a different thing. You know, I can, I, uh, I can put a piece of uh, uh, clay over there. But if the, if, the porter doesn't, if the porter is not invited, if the porter is not invited to touch that uh, uh, clay out, out there, the clay will remain like that. Because the, what will the clay do? You can get so much clay, the best clay, whatever. You put it there, it's useless. It needs the touch of the porter. Isaiah, in the end, looks up to God and says, Oh, Lord, I thank God for our relationship. And our relationship is all about what? The porter and the clay. Meaning this, the clay is helpless. The clay cannot shape and define himself. The clay needs the porter. And the porter... One of the things that I like about Porter, I lived in a place called Medain for about 13 years, pastor in the church there. One of the things that is known about this, this, this province, Medain, is that they were known for their clay pots. They were known for their clay pots. And they made a lot of money out of that. As, you know, there was a little village, or a little, yeah, just a few villages up there, and the tourists would come and they would watch them just like that, you know, pick it up out here, crush them, make them soft in the fire out, warm it up in their, in their flame. Oh, and um, it was an interesting thing. You know, um, we asked, why, why do you have to go through all the process, all of that? And he says, you know, he says, you see all these porters? He said, you know, the thing about them, they would never be ready. They would never be ready. The clay is never ready up until they do fill it around and know that there is no little, no little, no anything that is 
hard that's in there. It needs to all melt away. It, uh, um, uh, it, it needs to go really, really soft. It needs to go softer and very, very soft. And then put him on again. He says he fills them. And they know when to, when to start shaping it. When to start shaping it. But in the meantime, the clay doesn't say anything. The clay doesn't get up and tell the porter, excuse me, I don't like this shape. Excuse me, I don't like this color. Excuse me, I don't like the way you're handling me. No, the clay does not say anything. But when the porter is done, the clay attracts. When the porter is done, the vessel reflects the porter. When the, when the vessel is finished, it reflects the porter. We're the same. Going down from verse number 1 all the way to 8, and we could all go all the way down to verse number 12, but let me just stop here by just saying this. God is in the, in the business of shaping you and I. If you and I can just honestly, as from verse number 1 all the way down and see ourselves where we are, and we just put ourselves before God and lay ourselves on the altar before God, you know what? God is the one that molds us far more better. Whether it be marriage, whether it be our, our personal lives, whether it be our children, whether it be our choices, whether be, whatever it is, God is in the business of shaping us. And I'd rather be shaped by God than anybody or anything or myself. Than myself. So t- he looks up and in in closes and says, you know, God, when you come down, certain things will be easier. Certain things will be easier. What will be easier? You know, it being in the presence of God, the first thing that you realize is this. God's holiness will convict and demand that let's get right with him. That's the first thing. If you're not a person that reads the Bible, you'd want to read the Bible now. The person that doesn't pray, you want to start praying now. You know, uh, you, 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 not, you, would, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see the unsaved, uh, I, mean, I mean, you still the unsaved people, and uh, it wouldn't move your heart. You didn't, see the, uh, the, you didn't see it as necessary to tell them about Jesus. Well, let God... Let his presence have a fresh vision in you and you watch what happens to your life. We all have known this thing called, I mean, three months, one, the first month, second month, the third month of our Christian life. You remember that experience when you got saved the first day? You remember that first week and the first month and the second month and the third month? Boy, the world died. Your favorite thing, your best friend, your fa- you name it, all those things just died. People attracted you, people pulled you, people forced you, and even the family got up and said, what's wrong with you? You're not the same, you know? God help us. That was because we had a fresh visit from God. And a first experience of the Holy Spirit of God residing in us. And boy, his presence just, first thing that reminded us was, wake up to your sin. Got it right with him. Then we realized that we can't go on living our life with him. God help me, go on. And then in closing, we know that every day of our life, he molds us, he molds us, he molds us. My question in closing is this, what is it that's in your life that truly God needs to shape, that truly God needs to do something about? What is it that's in my life, same as we, together? I pray may we come to God the way he wants us to come. And let's allow God to touch our life, stir our life to be what he wants us to be. I promise and I assure you, the excuses and the things that are holding you down will fly away like the dead leaf. Will fly away like the dead leaf. Shall we pray? Father, once again, thank you for the privilege, the opportunity to preach and to be able to serve you. Thank you for the precious souls that are here to listen to your word. Again, I pray, Heavenly Father, our surroundings might be very demoralizing, discouraging, disheartening, yet we know as the clay is in the hands of the potter, we know there is room for shaping. Father, as vessels we come before you, Lord, use us. But we want to be shaped in the way that you want us to be and use us the way you want to be used, Lord. Us to be used. Father, so much is happening around us. Many things are not motivating for our faith and our walk. But I pray, Lord, you'd, you'd touch us in a fresh way this, this, this evening. You'd remind and revive us in a very fresh way. And you'd refresh us in a very, very, very fresh way this evening, Lord. Please, Heavenly Father. As Pastor began.